We're talking about the Kingdom Way Part 4. But just before we get into this, if you're struggling with feeling lost, feeling alone, I want to say a quick word of prayer for you and that the Lord would help us to receive his word today. Precious Father, I pray for my friend who's feeling alone, who's feeling discouraged, hopeless, who's feeling lost. God, you are the way. You've made the way for us through Jesus. So right now, we receive your help. We receive your, your abiding presence, your companionship through Jesus by your precious Holy Spirit. And help us understand your word, the secrets of the mystery way. In Jesus' name, amen. This is going to be so good. I'm so excited to have the privilege of presenting this message, The Kingdom Way, Part 4, for you. Look, we learned in Part 1 and 2 that God transferred dominion and authority, according to Genesis 1, 26, from heaven to earth, which is like saying from the unseen world to the seen world. He did it in a very particular way, though. God moved that power directly from himself to mankind when he said, let us give mankind dominion and authority over all the earth. In doing that, listen, God set up a parameter and a condition for his own relationship to the earth by limiting it to and through mankind. Can I say that again? God set up a parameter for his own relationship to the earth by limiting it to and through mankind. Wow. This is so important to understand as you look around at both the bad and the good things that are happening on earth because ignorance and the belief of the enemy's lies lead people to think, well, if God were just loving, if he were more loving, he'd do something about all this bad and all this evil. But understanding this biblical truth will help you to understand that God has limited his ability to interfere, to intervene on earth by his word, his honor, when he said, let us give mankind dominion over all the earth. You see, God doesn't give and then take away. His character is straight. It's true. When God gives his word, he cannot violate that word by withdrawing or compromising it. God's character and holiness will never allow him to lie or violate his word. God did not, he did not say, let us have dominion over the earth. No, he said, let us give mankind dominion and authority. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't act or intervene or interfere in the affairs of humanity, but he needs to do it by proxy, by partnership with a person. He needs access in agreement with a person. Isn't that amazing? That's why when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, think about Matthew 6, we're told to pray this way, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Why did Jesus teach us to pray that way? Because otherwise his will is not done on earth as it is in heaven. Even when Jesus healed and performed miracles, look at what he said about himself. This is Jesus talking about himself in Matthew 9 verse 6. He said, but in order that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth. Jesus came doing acts and works of God on earth as the Son of Man with authority. Think of it. Jesus, the Son of God, intervened on earth using the authority that was given to, you guessed it, mankind. This is why God had to send his son Jesus in the flesh, all God and all man. Why didn't God save mankind from death as just God in heaven? Well, because he couldn't. He couldn't interfere on earth in the affairs of humanity without authority, which he had already given to mankind. Oh, yes. And since there was no perfect humans without sin in their DNA, God the Savior took on flesh a body, humanity, so that he could authorize salvation, healing, redemption for you and me here on earth. God does not do anything on earth without affiliation, association with a human being, a person on earth. And this helps us understand the necessity for God's entry into the human race by Jesus, the man born of a virgin, the Christ, God on earth dwelling among us. Listen, that's, the, that's what Christmas is all about. Emmanuel, it means God with us. 
in the flesh. Now, when God gave mankind dominion, God made Adam and Eve kings, royalty. They were called to rule, to reign, have supreme authority over everything, not each other, over everything. Remember this, Adam and Eve fell from dominion, not from heaven. They fell from dominion. How can you be redeemed? We need to be redeemed. We need to get the stuff back. There was a three-year-old boy and he was asked, son, where do you come from? Do you know where you came from? He thought for a moment, Walmart? See, parents in all seriousness, if we don't teach our children, teach your children the eternal truth of where they came from, the absence of absolutes will make them vulnerable to this cultural war on their identity, their purpose in life. They'll be confused about it. Their confidence, their self-worth will be stolen from them. Dare to believe the truth of God's word. So Adam and Eve, back to them, they fell from their identity of royal dominion, the kingdom. They bowed a knee to a deceiver, the devil, and they committed high treason. And guess what they lost? They lost dominion and authority, but they lost their identity. They gave their dominion away. Why do we have so many young people right now riding and screaming in the streets for their rights, for their way, my way? Because they're ignorant of their true identity and God's ultimate great plan for authority in his kingdom. God's way, the kingdom way. When you're drowning, guess what you do? You panic, you scream, you even act crazy, you flail. Colossians 1, verse 13, listen to this. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion, there's that word, of darkness, the dominion of darkness, and has transferred us where? Into the king's dominion, the kingdom of the son of his love. Talk about being saved from drowning, right? You see, there are consequences to giving away what God gives you. Adam gave away the farm, dominion over the earth. Then Satan set up his kingdom of darkness. It's a counterfeit where he gets to pull the strings, launch wars, diseases, famine, yes, even inflation. I've said it over and over. Life does not tolerate a vacuum. For example, take God and his absolutes of truth out of the education system, and the next thing you know, you've got insanity, not education. The devil knew Jesus was on earth to get humanity back God's gift of dominion. He doesn't want to ever lose control. He's the villain in the movie about an ancient dark kingdom with an emperor who enslaves mankind. He wants to crash the system so that he can relaunch with his goons in absolute control. It's the same old good versus evil. It's 1930s, Hitler in Germany. It's an evil substitute for the true way. Look, the elite globalists want their way just like Hitler wanted his way. Just like 2,000 years ago, the devil made a play for his way right to Jesus' face. Look at this in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, you know what? All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Can you imagine that? Then Jesus said to the devil, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. This is why your words, your prayers, your worship are so vitally important. Yes, vitally important. The enemy can't stand against your faith in God. And this is how you release faith. Jesus instructs us to pray in Matthew 6 because it gives God permission to interfere, to intervene in the earth, to overpower darkness with light. Earth is still under the original lease to mankind. And God needs you, my friend, to pray his will on earth, to get heavenly results here on earth. You get to authorize it. James chapter 5, verse 16, listen to this. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. And that means a righteous woman. The, I can say it this way. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous woman makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Why? Because you're so holy? No, 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 no. 
because Jesus is so holy. He's so righteous, and we get to pray in his name. God said this in Ezekiel chapter 22, that he was looking for a human to stand in the gap, to intercede for people so that he could save them, but he couldn't find anyone willing. That was back in Ezekiel chapter 22. God says a similar thing in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. God does nothing on earth without child of mankind being involved. Why? Because he has given us mankind, dominion, and authority. So it matters what you say, what you pray, what you're in faith for. Psalm 115, verse 16. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth has he given to the children of men. We know the heavens and the earth belong to God, but we can see here that God has truly given us a lease. It's for a time, but a lease of time to exercise authority here on earth. This is why Jesus taught us to pray. Father, pray this way, guys. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Because otherwise, God's will is not done here on earth as it is in heaven. Otherwise, many things happen that are bad things and not God's will. And just because someone has done something in the name of God or in the name of religion, it doesn't mean that God had anything to do with it. Unless the fruit of it is good, righteous, and perfect, it's not of God. I don't care how many amens or how many hallelujahs they tack on the end. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. You know, there was a pastor... He was up, you know, he was doing his thing in the service and he had the congregation standing, sitting, standing, sitting. And it was on the fourth time and this precious little five-year-old girl named Jennifer sitting in the front row. All of a sudden she gave a heavy sigh and she goes, again? <laughs> How many movies have had clergy standing over a dead body saying, well, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Hey, some misguided character misquoting the Bible does not make it so. I've heard people talk about tragedy, torment, abuse, floods, tornadoes, death and destruction, and somehow pin it all on my heavenly father. They call it an act of God. Even insurance companies blame God. But I've got a feeling they're not praying God's kingdom come, God's will be done. You see, that's character assassination. When someone blames you for something bad that you didn't do, that's slander. That's character assassination. That's misrepresentation, a blatant lie. Have you ever had people misrepresent you, slander your name? It's not a good thing. It's evil. Jesus said the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his MO. But we blame God and take no responsibility for the ugliness and the pain. Like we're these sweet little saints, like we're, we're, we're innocent. The ignorant misuse and neglect of authority is not a case for innocence. Humanity is guilty. Romans 3 says we've all sinned. Don't get into condemnation now because Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but that we could be free, but we can't be free until we take responsibility for what we need an antidote for, right? The antidote for our sin problem must be accepted and applied. Let me show you how God's kingdom way truly makes his benefits a reality. Pam and I, we had the privilege of hearing this amazing true life story from this very wealthy man, a very successful businessman one day. This is back when we were living in Nashville, and he was a self-proclaimed atheist, and he, he actually called himself a self-made man with all of his millions. Well, one day he got bone cancer. And the doctor said it was very advanced and it was very fast moving. And he spent all of his wealth traveling around to every specialist and every and any kind of doctor he could find to get better. And he wasn't getting better. And finally, the doctor said, you're dying. You just need to make things right. And you're on your way out. Well, he was sitting almost penniless, just a few bucks in his pocket in a cheap hotel in New York City. He'd already exhausted his last resource with his last attempt. And finally, in desperation, sitting on his cheap little hotel bed, he was like, I got to call on God. And he didn't know how to do it. And he thought, well, maybe there's a, a Bible in the nightstand. And sure enough, he opened it up. There was a Gideon's Bible. And he was like, God, if you're real, 
I need to hear from you. I need some direction. So he did one of those random things, which I don't recommend, but he just kind of opened up the Bible randomly, say, and then closed his eyes and put his finger down. And guess where his finger landed? Proverbs 3, starting at verse 5. He heard, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. See, that's all he'd ever done leaned on his own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Oh, he was getting a little convicted on that one. Then it said, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse eight, it will be health to your flesh. And listen to this, and strength to your bones. He stopped for a moment. He's like, God, this is exactly what I need. I need strength for my bones. I'm dying of this disease and I need a healing and strength in my bones. And he lifted his eyes again and he put his finger back where he'd left off and he started at verse nine and said, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Guess what he did? He was like, God, I've got like maybe $68 in my pocket. What, what do I do? And he felt like this unction just to go downstairs. And he looked out on the street and there was a Salvation Army across the street. He ran across the street to the Salvation Army, donated all of his 68 bucks. That was the end of his worth. That was the end of his financial wealth right there. That $68. He donated it to the Salvation Army. And he told us after that, in the next year, God began directing every step, leading him every way. And suddenly he was cured of cancer. Suddenly he found himself on a path of recovery to his health. Suddenly he began having new business deals. And within a year and a half, 18 months, all of his fortune was restored financially. But much more than that, much more than that, his health came back, his healing went manifested in his body. He was saved. He'd welcomed Jesus into his heart and he was living a brand new life that was no longer faithless, but faithful in Jesus. Are we really so ignorant to think that Christianity is about attending a church to somehow ease your guilt for the week? Sing to the back of someone's head for a few minutes and think that pleases God? Look, God didn't send Jesus to give us a church building. He sent Jesus to give us his kingdom, the kingdom way for whosoever will. Why? To get kingdom results. God gets no glory from you being stuck or sick in rituals and traditions. They go nowhere. He gets glory when you walk in your true identity in the royal family name of Jesus, King of Kings. How can you fulfill your purpose if you don't know who you really are? No family name. Do you really think a J-O-B or a career will satisfy that inner longing for rightness, for peace, for joy? Oh, only being who God designed you to be will provide context for these mysteries and blessings. The inheritance that God gives us is for the sons and the daughters. The sons and daughters of God, God calls royalty. Look at 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You cannot set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues of God without being who God made you to be, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood? What in the world is that? Well, royal because you're in God's family, right? God is the king of all eternity. How could you be in his family and be anything less? 2 Corinthians 5.17, I've always loved this verse, and it says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. You can't be the old person anymore. Only royalty can exercise true authority of the kingdom. This is why an old sinner mindset, no matter how humble that seems, it's not submitted to God. It can't work God's authority. A royal priesthood, because your role in life is to be a blessing to others. You're authorized to bring petitions to God, to pray for others, making what God considers legal requests that move his hand on their behalf because you authorized heaven on earth. Oh, that's good. You see, this is why Jesus 
Jesus never told us to go and preach a gospel. No, we are instructed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's the only way to produce a royal priesthood. When Jesus said, repent, it fully sounded like this. Hey, repent for the kingdom of God is near. The king calls his citizens to change their thinking. He's restoring order. Praise God. Jesus restores our inner reality of true identity, joy, and peace, directing the outer reality of our life. This does not come natural, my friends. It's learned by knowing the Word of God, the Bible. It's Holy Spirit taught. You can't have kingdom kingdom of God supply grasping what's external, trying to pull it inside. The answer to all your dreams coming true is God's kingdom on the inside of you, within you, steering your outer reality. Jesus told those listening to him, he said, freely you've received, now freely give. See, he knew that was the right order. Myra Wattinger was a single 40-year-old nurse. One day she was doing a home care visit for an ailing senior man when his middle-aged son showed up drunk, and then he did the unthinkable. He raped her. Myra found out she was pregnant. This was 1943, and she felt hopeless. She wanted to get an abortion. Myra thought about killing herself. She prayed to God, and God stepped into her thinking. He intervened for Myra. She felt like God said, this baby is going to bring joy into the world. Now, fast forward to just a few years ago. Pam and I were on a famous Christian TV show out of Dallas, Texas. And before we left the studio, the host of the show gave me his book called my father's face. It was James Robeson. He was that unwanted baby that Myra had conceived. Even on his birth certificate, it asked the question, legitimate? And she wrote, no. But God, but God rewrote James' birth certificate with a big yes. This is my son in Christ Jesus. Legitimate. Yeah. Give him the family name. James Robeson was saved out of the kingdom of darkness, out of illegitimacy, out of the death curse of the enemy, and drawn into the kingdom of God's dear son, Jesus. He not only got saved from darkness, but he got saved for the light. From being a baby destined for abortion, God ransomed James' life, and James globally sets forth the wonderful deeds, the works of God, the virtues of God, and the perfections of God for everyone to see being a royal priesthood. That's what I call that. Look, you can have that too. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter who has rejected you, hated you, forsaken you, or scarred you. Jesus has paid the full price for you to be God's child, God's royal family, recommissioned with dominion and authority as an envoy of King Jesus, not religion. I repeat again, Jesus didn't bring us religion, but power for the kingdom way. Remember in part two, we discovered that you cannot see the kingdom way, the map of life, until you're born again. You need those spiritual glasses, so to speak, to perceive the mystery. John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you have to have that natural birth and then be born again of the Spirit. You must have spiritual rebirth to be able to recognize the kingdom way. This is why we sing amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found was what? Blind, but now I see. It's amazing the act of God's grace through faith that we get his free gift of God. The sad thing is, is when people who say they invite Jesus into their heart, but they refuse to give Jesus his rightful place on the throne of their heart, Jesus is the king. Otherwise, he really is nothing to you. Judas is proof of that. He shared the campfire with Jesus, but he wouldn't let Jesus have his rightful place on the throne of his heart, and he died a child of hell. Do not be deceived by proximity to Jesus. Being close to Jesus but not giving him the throne of your heart does not make him the Lord of your life. Judas was close. Herod was physically close. The high priest was face-to-face with Jesus. 
Pontius Pilate, he sat so close to Jesus. The soldiers who beat Jesus, they were so close to Jesus that his blood sprayed in their faces when they hit him. But physical proximity doesn't save anybody. You need Jesus in your heart, seated on the throne of your life. Look at Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and driven out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I will say to them openly, publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. Look, doing Jesus' things and working his name is not, I repeat, not the same thing as having him reigning over your heart. It's not the same thing as you living in his kingdom. Jesus the King redeems us from the inside out, not from the outside in. What do I mean? Have you ever watched one of those fixer-upper shows, you know, where they do the renovations? They take a broken down, unlivable house and they save it. They heal it. They renovate it from the inside out. They take away the rot, the asbestos, the termite damage, the sin, if you will. And then they make the house new again, this worthless, forsaken house into a blessed, beautiful home. Does it affect the outside? Absolutely. But the house is restored from the invisible to the visible, from the plan to the reality, from the dream to the tangible outcome. God has already dreamed your glorious outcome, but he needs you to agree to the plan, his kingdom way you get to choose. Judas, he let Jesus in on the front lawn, but he never let Jesus in in his heart. He had wrought asbestos in his heart, but he wouldn't give Jesus permission to renovate his heart. Therefore, Jesus said this, I never knew him. Judas was damned. Judas chose the termites and the rot over Jesus being the Lord of his life. Peter, on the other hand, he also proved that he had some rot. He had some stupid asbestos thinking, didn't he? But he welcomed Jesus to be the renovator, the savior of his life. Peter welcomed Jesus on the inside of him. The kingdom moves from the inside to the outside, from the throne of the king throughout his kingdom. It's ignorant and futile to expect the renovation, the benefits, the provision, the protection, the promises of the king while refusing his way, the kingdom way. You can't have the renovation benefits of the kingdom while at the exact same time refusing Jesus' kingdom. Like I said in a previous part of the series, you can't order a Whopper in a McDonald's. You're in the wrong kingdom. You're speaking the wrong language. Luke 17, verse 21, Jesus said this, Nor will people say, look, here it is, or see, it is there. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within you, in your hearts, and among you, surrounding you. The heavens and the earth are the Lord's. He owns it all. Yet, he wants the realm of your heart today. Today, the king wants to come into your heart, save you, and give you his kingdom way, his glorious way. How do I get that? Just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need all that you have for me. You are the way. Your kingdom come in my life. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. Now take the throne of my heart. Be the Lord of all my choices, all my decisions. Give me every kingdom benefit in your name, Jesus. Amen.